So when you look at 1 Samuel 15, as I mentioned last week, this is, this is really the, the, the chapter where very clearly the wheels are off. We've been seeing Saul kind of unravel and we've been getting glimpses of the kind of man that Saul is. And we've tried very hard to rely upon God's word, not, not, to, sh- to, not to tell us, you know, don't be like Saul, be like Jonathan or be like David. We're not coming to God's word for that. We're coming to God's word to ask, what is God revealing about himself, about us, about who he is and who we are, about our need of him, about our savior, about the way that he has worked in the history of redemption and what that means for us as we consider not only our redemption, but our future and the way that we relate to others around whom we're placed as the people of God. 15 is not a very comfortable chapter for a number of reasons. And we're just going to, we're going to consider the first part of it this morning. But there are a lot of difficult things in chapter 15. And we'll do our best to get to all those, although we're not going to cover all of them today. It's difficult to see what Saul does. It's difficult to hear Samuel's revelation from God, Samuel's having to go and interact with Saul because of what Saul decided to do. It's uncomfortable like any parent who knows what a child has done and asks the child what they've done and has to listen to the child who didn't know that they were being watched, try to pass off as though they didn't do it when you watch them do it. It's an uncomfortable feeling. (laughs) You thought that it was uncomfortable if you got caught in a lie. Well, it's not very comfortable to catch someone in one either. When it's not, especially when it's someone that you love. It's even more difficult to watch Saul grovel in a self-serving way, only to be rejected by God, to be ultimately rejected by Samuel. It's not a pretty picture. When God has to say to somebody, I get it. You, you did the things. You, I, you, you wanted to make a sacrifice. It, it's like a kid who, who takes something, maybe they take some money, and they say, oh, well, I was going to use this for you. <laughs> sure you were. Right. Yeah. By way of you satisfying your desires. And Samuel has to, has to tell Saul, this man whom Samuel put in place at God's command, the, the man who essentially took Samuel's place as the leader of these people, it is an uncomfortable chapter. And we would like to read through it and say, I'm nowhere in there because there's no good guys here, right? (laughs) We just cannot afford to do that. And as we start, the beginning of this might seem kind of odd and mundane and it's setting some background, but if we are careful to listen and to watch and to ask the question about who God is displaying himself to be, there is a sobering message that has to be understood before we come to what follows with Saul and Samuel. So let's start by reading this first portion of the story here. This is 1 Samuel 15, starting in the first verse. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in, in opposing them on the, way, on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them. 
but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them, and tell him, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, all that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he has set up a monument for himself. I turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you, uh, blessed be Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the low lowing of oxen that I hear? Saul said, well, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the ox to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. And Samuel said to Saul, Stop. I will tell you, what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. <laughs> this is, um, as I said, I don't, I don't know if you grip this, I don't know if you read ahead, you know, what, it's easier when we are going in a consecutive uh, fashion through a passage, you kind of know where we're headed. You probably don't know how far we'll get. I feel the same way sometimes I don't know how far we'll get but you know where we're going so maybe you you read ahead and if you've been reading through this chapter and maybe you, you felt the weight of this you know what's coming you know how this exchange goes down um, but there are also some things that are very familiar not the least of which there you see in the first verse the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people listen to his word there's a constant re-emphasis on the fact that God is, was, is, and always will be the king over his people. That's always the way that it should have been. Even the instructions left uh, when Moses gave instructions to the people and God gave those to him. The instructions left for kings were that the kings were to point people to God, that the king was the one who was to have God's word in his mouth all the time to write copies for himself, to memorize it, to read it, to protect it, and to point to people. He was put in place to represent God to the people, but always to point the people to God as the ultimate king. That's why when we they made this switch, begging for this king like everybody else, God had to tell Samuel, Listen, it's not you they've rejected, it's me. I'm the king they're kicking out, and they want a different one. And you see that even in the way that Samuel still comes to Saul, these are the Lord's people. The Lord sends whom he wants. He sent me to make you king over his people. They're still his, by the way, and you need to listen to what he has to say. I mean, imagine this position as a prophet, as a person of God, and you were to go to the one deemed to be leader, the one who took your place even, whom you had to put in that position and he's the king. We don't have a good feel for that. I mean, not even the president of the United States holds the same kind of position as a king over a kingdom. Not supposed to, anyway. This is, this is, this is the man for these people. This is, this is, for them, this is the guy in charge, the guy in power. And you have to go to this person and say things like this. You listen to what God has to tell you because these are his people. 
Samuel comes. And it's a constant reminder to us, as well as to these people and to Saul, that God is the ruler over his people. He is the only sole and sovereign ruler over his people. And it is his word that he gives to his people that we are to listen to, that we are to follow. Not, not We're in place to follow the best of the worldly wisdom about economics or about ecology or whatever it is. God's word is God's rule over God's people. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. We may live in a country that has a constitution. We are under the rule of God's word, period. As good citizens, we're, we're called to give honor where honor is due, to obey. The only exceptions that we are given are that we are not to do what God forbids and we are not to forbid or not do what God commands. So Samuel has to come to Saul. He's had some success. He's involved his family. We saw, uh, we didn't cover, but at the end of fifth, at the end of fourteen, he's taking all the best people he can find and plugging them into his administration. And militarily, he had some success. He had great success. And so now God comes to him through Samuel with this mission. This is not. This is not a, a pleasant task that he's been given there is some background here and um, if you if you want you can see that in Exodus as well as in Deuteronomy in Exodus remember this is the story of God delivering his people out of Egypt and on their way out uh, there is this incident where there's sort of a, a, an uprising in the congregation and God gives them water from a rock and in, Do, in uh, Exodus 17, then, um, it says that uh, in 14, then, Mo, then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Well, why, why would he do He goes on to say, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Well, well why is it? Well, if you go back up, you find... Oh, choose for us men. Amalek came out and fought with Israel. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men to go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand at the top of the hill with my staff. Remember, this is the scene where as long as Moses has his staff raised, Israel's winning. And as, as when he lowers his hand, then Amalek was winning. If you uh, move on down to um, Deuteronomy 25, when Moses is sort of recounting a lot of these things and giving his instructions to the people. Uh, remember, Moses didn't go into the promised land with the people. He recovers a lot of things, and he says uh, in Deuteronomy 25, 17, Moses says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came up out of Egypt? How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you. And he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that your Lord, that the Lord your God is giving to uh, you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. These were a wicked, wicked people who did. I mean, war is never pretty. These people came along behind, took the old the weak, those who were lagging behind. They had no scruples, no morals. These were a wicked people. And God had made very clear, I will take them out. You are not to forget this. And when I've given you rest from all your enemies, I will blot them out. I will wipe them out. So now you come to, after many, many years, these people are still around. And God comes to Saul and he says, okay, you're going to these people and you are going to wipe them off the map. Every one of them. Don't leave a single one, man, woman, child, infant, every animal they had, nothing of them, none of them, nothing of theirs is to be left. Devote 100% of it to destruction. Let, let's let's not let's just get this out of the way right now. This is not an ethnic proposition. 
God's not doing this because he doesn't like their kind. These are people whom God made. These are people of whom it's said later on down uh, in, in 1 Samuel 15 that these who are being devoted to destruction are being devoted to destruction because they're sinners. Verse 18, And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites. Wait a minute. <laughs> isn't, it, uh, isn't it the New Testament that says that we have all sinned? Yes, the new and the old. Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own way. Every descendant of Adam is under the burden of sin. None of us in this room could raise our hand and say, I, I am free from sin. I've never sinned. I've never violated God's command. And here God has decided to fulfill what he said he would do and it's interesting as you look at this idea that they are to be devoted to destruction to devote an animal to be offered in sacrifice to be to be burned is to give up something completely to the lord in such a way that it gives up any of my use or dependence or or glory or benefit from that thing and and, and i'm devoting all of this to god under god's sovereign will under his power to his glory I'm dependent on God for all of these things. Which is why reserving something back for ourselves from that is a reprehensible and a faithless thing. We can remember Achan back in Joshua who was told they were supposed to completely wipe out a people and Achan takes some silver and his gold for himself and buries it under his tent. And then things go wrong and they start going, okay, somebody in the camp has sinned. And they finally realize that it's him. And they kill him and his family. For having taken this stance to do other than God had said. But God wants us to kill all these people. It's not because of their kind. It's because he has devoted them to destruction. This is judgment on sinners. Is God wrong to do that? Is he wrong to judge sinners? Do these people love and trust and depend on by faith in Yahweh? No, they do not. Is God being righteous and just in delivering judgment to them? Yes. That's his place. They hate him. They violate his commands. They have no regard for God whatsoever. He is judging them. That is his prerogative. It is his right. That he didn't do it prior to this is an act of patience of his own providence and prerogative of when and how and where he decides to do what he's decided to do. What does Saul do? Saul does what Saul always does. He doesn't do what God says. He does what he thinks seems best to him, what's going to give him the most credit, what's going to put him in the best light. And then when he's called on it, he blames the people. He blames he denies and he justifies. I did what you, I did, I, look, hey, welcome. I've done everything you asked me to do. And what is Samuel like? Really? What is it that I hear? It seems to me like I hear sheep and I hear oxen. Why do I hear that? Because they were supposed to be dead, Saul. I mean, you could hear it in the, you know, like it's just a, it's an interesting way that the writer chose to, to portray, I guess, uh, the way that Samuel says this. What is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? No, Saul, you didn't do what God said to do. Well, the people, oh, here we go. I can see Samuel's face. Here we go again, right? I get it. Your brother did it. It's your brother's fault. It's your sister's fault. It's somebody else's fault. But Saul's the king. It's not the people's fault, Saul. It's your fault. You were the leader in this, and you gave the worst to destruction which is where God wanted all of it. You took what you deemed to be best for yourselves. 
You claim that what you were going to do was perform some religious function because that would make God happier. You have put yourself in the place of God, Saul. You've made an idol for yourself. And Samuel says as much in the, pa- the portion that we haven't read yet. He refers to the things that Saul has done as rebellion and he compares them to divination, iniquity, and idolatry. When God says this is how it's supposed to go, when we create for ourselves a God who tolerates or is pleased even more with less or other, we have made an idol. That is not the God of Scripture. And God is not pleased to share his glory with any second-rate knockoff of who he said he is. And as we consider all these things, what is most sobering about all of this is that God is judging sinners. And for those people, this was ultimate and final. There is no coming back from this. If you, even if you get to the end of the, or especially as you get to the end of the story and you see how Samuel finishes the work that Saul was supposed to have done, it is a graphic picture. The Bible says that Samuel hacked Agag to pieces. After Agag's like, well, surely we're all, we're good here, right? Everybody's kind of calmed down. The threat of death has passed. No. God has decided that you are to be judged and judged to destruction you will be. And he hacked him to pieces. God's prophet hacked this man to pieces. If we try to soften this, if we try to explain this away, if we try to pretend like God needs some kind of defending to make him seem more loving like we think of him to be, like we tell other people that he is, if we try to join people like Richard Dawkins in his game who accuses God of being this awful, capricious tyrant who who is homophobic and ethnophobic and all these kinds of things, because he does not understand what he sees. He sees God as being evil and wicked and malicious and someone who goes after certain ethnic groups of people. But what God is telling us is that it is my place and my right to judge sinners and I will do it and they will not escape. So that when we come to passages that point to us and they say that we are sinners. Those whom we love, our women, our men, our children. When we hear the scripture tell us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, when we go into the New Testament and we read things from Paul's letters, for example, like in Ephesians chapter 2, where we are told, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Spiritually, yes, and also in a prophetic sense, as in you're not escaping this. If you stay in that state without Christ, where you are, you are dead. You are as good as dead because God will judge everyone by the standard of his righteousness in his son. You were dead. You followed the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now in work and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We don't escape that. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians to encourage them And one of the great needs of their encouragement as he's encouraging them, he says, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols and served the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We often think about the wrath to come and we think, well, we just skip to the end. That's where it all comes because it hasn't come yet, right? That's what we say. And in Revelation 20, we go there and we find phrases like this in verse 11. 
And I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's everybody. The living, the dead, the young, the old. No matter where you died or where you came from, even in the Acts, Paul is preaching the gospel. He's coming to a group of Gentiles there in Athens, these people who like to sit around and consider themselves intelligent and smart, and they're sort of above all these folk horror stories and scare stories about, about these gods and whatnot. And, and that may be the equivalent in our day. Maybe these were Stokes. Maybe they still had some belief in the ancient Roman and Greek gods. And here's how Paul puts it to them in verse 30 of Acts 17. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere. We just pause right there for a second. Who is not in that category? No one. God commands. This is the gospel. It's a command. All people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The standard is Jesus Christ, who is God in human flesh. And if there are those who do do not meet the standard of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, they will be cast into the lake of fire and I didn't even take the time to write out the number of verses that describe that result as eternal punishment or eternal torment. Those are the kinds of things that Jesus said about those people. Are you as righteous as Jesus Christ? There is a day of judgment coming. Everyone doesn't get a medal. Everyone doesn't get a participation trophy. Everyone's not a winner. Living in a culture that thinks that way and treats people that way is setting people up for a massive failure. And it seems more noble. They pass this off under the guise of being more accepting, more loving, more kind, more merciful. Everybody's a winner. And what they're doing is making an idol for themselves because God says, not everybody wins. And outside of Jesus Christ, nobody wins. And I will judge. There will be winners. There will be losers. And it will be based on the standard of my righteousness. That's the only winner. Judgment is coming. And everybody doesn't get a medal. If we consider that biblical teaching, that warning of God's judgment with this modern mindset, then what we are betraying is that we don't actually believe the Bible. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. It's demanding. And if we don't believe the Bible, then we don't really even believe in the God who wrote it. Who's the one who declares this sort of a thing? This is not just an Old Testament phenomenon. If you look at Peter, Peter had words of warning for those to whom he wrote as well, for those believers in 2 Peter. Second Peter 3. Peter writes, now this is the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. 
by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. We're all up in arms about how we're all going to die because we use plastic straws or because we use gasoline in our cars or whatever other thing. The climate's going to get us. God forbid it be a degree hotter. Listen, we survived a week of some hot. We're more worried about the temperature or about, not that we shouldn't be good stewards. Don't, don't hear me say that that's all to be just thrown out on, on its ear. We should be good stewards and we should be better stewards. Of, of, of God's creation that we've been placed in charge over. Don't get me wrong. But being more worried about some plastic straws than the coming judgment of God and the destruction of the ungodly is a gross oversight. We have made a God out of our nobility, our sense of what's right and wrong and good and perfect. We've made a God out of this world, out of creation, out of our sense that we've done better for something because of our own wisdom. And God's not going to share His glory and the standard is one that we cannot reach. Neither can any of those whom we love, if we truly love them, to say this idol of a God that you worship that's okay with your sin is not loving because it's not true and you're placing them in the path of an impending and inescapable judgment. It's not going to be Samuel that comes and hacks people to pieces. It will be the Lord himself who sits on the throne and says, I never knew you. Away from me, you workers of iniquity. And they will be cast into a lake of fire with the devil. No distinction there. Same end result for all of those we should not dismiss the coming judgment. Jesus was also very clear about this in Matthew 10 when he says in verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Listen to the words of the Lord. In Deuteronomy, they were told, Listen. This is given to you to teach one another, to teach your kids. Don't forget what I have said. The writer of Hebrews says, today is the day of salvation. If you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your heart. In Romans, Paul writes, at the beginning of chapter 2, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, you, every, O man who... Every one of you judges who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things regarding the list of sins and, and rejections in, at the end of chapter one, those who practice such things yet do them yourself, that you'll escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It seems harsh. Women, children, animals, all of it. They just want to offer you a sacrifice. I thought you were happy with those things. And Samuel will remind Saul, and God reminds all of us, obedience to the true and living God is better than these sacrifices. These things that you think you'd rather do. Do you think you're more merciful? Because you spared this wicked king that I decided to judge. You're more merciful than me. You're more wise than me. You've got a better sense of how this goes. You can decide when and where to dispense out judgment. God says, absolutely not. Because of this, I'm going to tear the kingdom from your hands. You're done. And I'm going to find your neighbor, who Samuel has to tell Saul, is a better man than you. 
Who among us is as good as Jesus Christ? None. Then who among us can escape the judgment? None, except in Jesus Christ. And in him only. He's the ark. He's the temple. He's the one to whom we run. He's the lamb whose blood is over the door. He's the only way of salvation because in Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us. Not when we earn it by doing the things and giving the sacrifices and coming to church and doing all the things that we think good Christian people should do. Saul knew all those things and he tried to pull them off and it just made everything worse. God's after the heart. And like Jesus said, if you love me, You'll obey my commandments. Loved ones, if we try to soften the judgment of God, we are doing not only a disservice to ourselves and to our neighbors, whom we are supposed to love and to whom we are supposed to take the truth in love, the gospel. That gospel includes the truth of an impending judgment. But we are furthermore making an idol out of God that we are more comfortable with. But God has appointed a day by which he will judge the living and the dead. We confess that this morning. Do you believe it? If you do, then obey God. Rely upon God. Confess your sins. And truthfully and lovingly and honestly and earnestly share that truth with others. So that on that day, we may be found in Christ. Righteous, blameless, holy, beloved, saved from the wrath that is coming. Amen.